So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Again, my name is Renee Van Norman and I'm the educator and founder of Well Educator. I provide professional development for educator well-being in some traditional formats uh, for uh, in-person professional development as well as virtual professional development, more of that these days considering the pandemic. And I also provide virtual wellness communities where educators get together and support each other in wellness planning. And I'm gonna let Mackenzie introduce herself. All right, hello, good afternoon. I'm Mackenzie Weintraub. I'm an early childhood education consultant uh, and I work with um, childcare programs, um, early intervention, early childhood special education, Head Start and, and school districts. And I primarily help um, train and coach teachers and home visitors um, around the pyramid model um, or ECPBIS, if that's a familiar term to you. So all about supporting children's social emotional development. And at this point, really focusing on um, helping people teach parents how to support children's social emotional development. And I'm so excited you guys are here today. So we really have only two learning objectives today, but a lot of content to cover. We're gonna learn specific ways for early childhood educators to support both themselves and families during this COVID-19 pandemic. And we hope that you obtain a variety of resources specific to early childhood education and educators during the COVID-19 pandemic. The other day I was feeling meh, mixed emotions, probably more like the stress and high anxiety and a little bit of fear. In changing over some of my materials from in-person to online. And a good friend of mine reminded me that if I did something for my mind, body, and being, I was having a good day. Meaning, if I could just do something, at least one thing for my mind, body, and being, and being could be anything like you can think of as your heart or your spirit, doing one thing for your mind, body, and being each day, you're having a really good day. And you know, sometimes that's difficult in and of itself. Self-care kind of falls to the bottom of the list. It really doesn't come first. It often is the last thing on my mind. I'm wor worried about taking care of other people and nurturing others. Well, when we nurture ourselves, we're better nurturing others. That's one of Well Educator's core assumptions. And I think sometimes I even forget that. Remember what I said about doing something, even just a little something for your mind, body, and being each day? Here are some examples, and some of which were on your self-care list. For your mind, maybe you just occupy yourself with some coloring, or maybe reading is what you do to occupy your mind for the day. Playing a game for your body. Maybe you go for a walk, like you said. Maybe just drinking some water. Maybe that's what you do for your body that day. How about just taking a shower? Maybe that's what you can handle for your mind and your body that day. For your being, imagining a relaxing scene, affirming this too shall pass, opening your heart to some self-compassion and giving yourself some grace. And maybe just taking a brief vacation, pulling the covers over your head for just a little while might be just what you need to open your heart and be there for yourself that day. You'll notice on the top of the being column is mindfulness exercises or meditation. That really goes across all mind, body and being. It just so happened to land there in my table. We don't have much time to go into the mindfulness and all of its superpowers, but we did pull a video from Happify that talks about the superpower of mindfulness. And we're gonna share that video with you now. You may have heard this word mindfulness. It's become something of a buzz phrase of late. So I'm gonna give you one simple serviceable definition, which is this. Mindfulness is the ability to know what's happening in your head at any given moment without getting carried away by it. Imagine how useful this could be. Just as an example, you're driving down the road and somebody cuts you off in traffic. How do you normally react? I think most of us, we normally react by having a thought, which is, I'm pissed. And then what happens next? 
you immediately, habitually, reflexively inhabit that thought. You actually become pissed. There's no buffer between the stimulus and your reaction. With just a little bit of mindfulness, in that same situation, you might notice my chest is buzzing, my ears are turning red, I'm having a starburst of self-righteous thoughts. I'm getting angry. But you don't necessarily have to act on it and chase that person down the road, screaming at them with your kids in the back of the car thinking you've gone nuts. Now, you might be thinking, don't I need to get angry sometimes? Aren't I justified? I would say yes, but probably not as much as you think. The proposition here is not that you should be rendered by mindfulness into some lifeless, non-judgmental blob. The proposition is that you should learn how to respond wisely to things that happen to you rather than just reacting blindly. And that, my friends, is a superpower. How do you get it? The way to get it is through meditation. I believe that meditation and mindfulness are the next big public health revolution. In the 1940s, if you told somebody you were going running, they would have said, who's chasing you? But then what happened next? The scientists swooped in, they showed that physical exercise is really good for you, and now all of us do it, and if we don't, we feel guilty about it. And that's where I think we're headed with mindfulness and meditation. It's gonna join the pantheon of no-brainers like brushing your teeth, eating well, and taking the meds your doctor prescribed for you. Let me just close by saying, Mindfulness is not going to solve all of your problems. It's not going to render your life a nonstop parade of unicorns and rainbows. Nonetheless, this is a superpower and one that is accessible by you immediately. And there are many benefits to practicing mindfulness. And as I mentioned, we don't have an opportunity to go into all of the wonders of mindfulness and how to begin a mindfulness practice and how to practice mindfulness and meditation. But there are many benefits and I encourage you to um, look at the resources in the resource handout that we provided to you. You may have gotten it at the uh, waiting room. You'll also be getting it as a follow-up email and there are are opportunities in that resource guide to set up a med meditation or mindfulness practices. And mindfulness meditation practices do not have to be 20 or 30 minutes long. You can practice mindfulness as you're washing the dishes, as you're uh, mindfully eating. It really means just paying attention on purpose, um, bringing your attention back to the thing that you're doing in the moment. The benefits of mindful, mindfulness, especially during times of high anxiety or of times of stress, is that you can focus your attention on the task at hand. It helps with emotional regulation to help you bring back tools that you know work for you in those times of high stress. It helps bring a pause between um, action and reaction so that you can respond rather than react to a situation. It also increases compassion. So you can have a sense of compassion and self-compassion rather than um, beat yourself up and talk yourself down and have that self-criticism happening in that loop that happens for a lot of us during times of stress. It helps you be present for the person that you're with, including yourself. And it brings a sense of stillness, rest, and relaxation, and really helps you delve into your well of resilience, which we know you have. You as educators have that well of resilience. You've been, even though you haven't experienced this before, you've experienced difficult situations in which you can get through the most difficult situations. Educators have resilience and you can dig deep into that well of resilience and get through on the other side. So as I was preparing for a different webinar, we came across, I came across this video by Dr. Russ Harris, the author of The Happiness Trap, which I highly recommend his book. Um, and he did, he uses the acronym FACE COVID for facing this pandemic in a very healthy way. Um, it's baked, based on acceptance and commitment therapy. Uh, and it, and if you're interested in that, just um, email me at renee at balleducator.com and I can tell you more about it. It's 
we can't go into it more here, but um, this is really a video where he breaks down face COVID and talks about things um, to keep us healthy during this pandemic. And then what Mackenzie and I did was break it down for educator well-being and for working with families. So we're going to go into that video now, and then we'll break that down for you in the next part of the webinar. When we face a crisis of any sort, fear and anxiety are inevitable. They are normal natural responses to any challenging situation infused with danger and uncertainty. Face COVID is a set of practical steps for dealing with such situations. F is for focus on what's in your control. You can't control what happens in the future. You can't control coronavirus itself or the world economy or what other people do and you can't magically control your thoughts and feelings. Fear, anxiety and worry are inevitable. But you can control what you do here and now. So let's focus on that. A is for acknowledge your thoughts and feelings. Silently and kindly acknowledge whatever is showing up inside you. Thoughts, feelings, emotions, memories, sensations, urges. With curiosity, notice what's going on in your inner world. You might say to yourself, I am noticing feelings of anxiety, or I'm having thoughts about getting sick, or I'm having feelings of loneliness. And as you continue acknowledging your thoughts and feelings, bring in the next step, which is C, come back into your body. Find your own way of connecting with your physical body. For example, you might try slowly pressing your feet hard into the floor, or slowly pressing your fingertips together, slowly stretching your arms or your neck or shrugging your shoulders, or slowly breathing. And as you acknowledge your thoughts and feelings and come back into your body, you then move to E, which is for engage in what you're doing. Get a sense of where you are here and now and refocus your attention on the activity at hand. Notice five things you can see, five things you can hear. Notice what you can touch and taste and smell. Notice what you are doing and give your full attention to that activity. And then C is for committed action. This means effective action guided by your core values. Action you take because it's important to you, even if it brings up difficult thoughts and feelings. Of course, this includes following official guidelines on what to do during this crisis. But in addition, ask yourself regularly, what can I do right now, no matter how small it may be, that improves life for myself or others I live with or people in my community? And whatever the answer is, do it and engage in it fully. O is for opening up. This means making room for difficult feelings and being kind to yourself. As this crisis unfolds, we'll all feel fear, anxiety, anger, sadness, guilt, loneliness, and so on. We can't stop these painful feelings from arising, but we can open up and make room for them. Acknowledge they are normal, allow them to be there even though they hurt, and treat ourselves kindly. Consider what are kind words you can say to yourself, and kind things you can do for yourself, to help you cope with this suffering. V is for values. Committed action should be guided by your core values. What do you want to stand for in the face of this crisis? What sort of person do you want to be as you go through this? How do you want to treat yourself and others? Your values might include love, respect, humor, patience, courage, honesty, caring, openness, kindness, compassion, or numerous others. Look for ways to sprinkle your values into your day and let them guide and motivate your actions. I is for identify resources. 
Identify resources for help, assistance, support and advice. This includes friends, family, neighbours, health professionals and emergency services. Make sure you know the emergency helpline phone numbers, including those for psychological help if required. D is for disinfect and distance. Remember to disinfect regularly and practice physical distancing for the greater good of your community. Please run through the steps of face COVID as often as you can for the benefit of yourself, your loved ones and all the people in your community. So this um, particular um, infographic, I'm sure you've seen circling on Facebook and Instagram. And this is a, um, I thank Brandy from the counseling teacher for allowing us to use it in our um, webinar today. But this is just for citizens in general using what is in and what is out of our control in relation to the pandemic. And if we focus on what is in our control, we're much more likely to be in on the happy end of the happy um, stick than we are on the unhappy end. And this is the cornerstone of what Dr. Harris was talking about, if we can focus on what's in our control. So we're going to break down the face COVID and for the educator now on educator well-being. And one um, activity that I was given once uh, for focusing on what's in our control is the tip the scale activity. And it's really not about counting which pennies land in which pile, but if you're a visual person like me and need to see how things fall in what, what list, you can have a situation where you need to find out what is in your control and what's out of your control. For example, if you were to, take a packet over to a family and they say that they're too overwhelmed to do the packet and you walk away thinking, I'm really bad at my job and I can't do this and I have a hard time with this new work, this new way of doing things. And you're having that thought and you're really having a hard time and you're feeling having big feelings about the whole situation and you want to figure out what's in your control and what's out of your control. So you sit down with your pennies and you say, OK, what's in my control is the kinds of activities that I give them. So that gets one penny in the what's in my control. What's in my control is the kinds of resources that I can take to them. What's in my control is that I can listen to them. What's out of my control is how much stress they're under. What's out of my control is whether they do the packet or not. You're getting the gist of it. It's not about counting up the pennies, but it's just about a way of giving yourself space to start thinking about what is and is out of your control. Acknowledging your thoughts and feelings. I'm having the thought that I'm not helping right now rather than I'm not helping right now. You're putting space between your thought and the feeling. So I'm having the thought is adding that space and that you're not really your thought. And that helps give yourself some space. I don't know about you, but I've been on my computer a whole heck of a lot more these days. And I've had moments where I think I kind of suck at this stuff. Um, talking to my computer is not where I've been in the past. And so it's been a little bit difficult and challenging. And so when I have the thought, I suck, um, a diffusion technique that I've learned is that if I sing it out loud in a funny voice and over and over again, I can diffuse it and not give it its power. Um, I'm not going to do that now because uh, I will spare you that singing, but um, it works. Um, and you can also put uh, the thoughts on leaves on a stream or put, attach them to a cloud and have them pass by. But you want to acknowledge your thoughts and feelings. You want to come back into your body. So fingers on a keyboard. You want to just feel that your fingers are on that keyboard and come back into your body. You can do a body scan. You can feel the, where the tension is in your body and relax your body. And some of you are already doing this as you talked about your mindfulness. You can do four square or box breathing where you inhale for four, hold for four, exhale for four, and hold for four. 
You can engage in what you're doing. This takes preparation and practice because you're engaging one mindfully in daily routines. This is another way to cultivate mindfulness. Like I talked about earlier, that meditation is one way to cultivate mindfulness. But if you are brushing your teeth like you are a toddler for brushing your teeth like the very first time, and you're really taking it into your senses, you're um, tasting the toothpaste like you've never tasted toothpaste before, and you're really doing it mindfully, um, you're really leaning into the practice of eating mindfully or taking a walk mindfully and taking it in with fully with your five senses. You're engaging fully in what you're doing. Let's move on to the next. Committed action. What can I do to help myself right now? You can have a self-care plan and stick to that plan. I know I have a plan and there's days where I forget that I even... Um, I've been sitting at my desk for eight hours straight. You have to actually stick to that plan. And so setting up reminders on your phone or having it um, go off and reminding you to stand up and walk around and take mindful breaks um, and having a routine, having a sleep hygiene routine where you actually have a wind down routine. Looking at Facebook right before going to sleep is probably not the best option for many of us to wind down before we go to sleep. And if I can give you a message of it's good enough right now during this time and that perfectionism and letting it go, that what we're doing is just good enough, that's a message that I'd like to share with you. And then what can I do to help families right now? I would say that small action with big impact is where we're at. Basic needs, read stories, access to resources. Maintenance is probably key right now, and that's where we're at. Um, opening up, be kind to yourself. How can you give yourself more grace right now? Uh, we've included in the resources package, um, loving kindness meditation, self-compassion meditations. These are times where you can actually just take time for yourself, send some loving kindness to yourself, be compassionate for yourself. And this takes time and it takes discipline and it takes the opportunity to make time in your schedule to actually do these things. But again, nurturing yourself before you nurture others is really the message that we're trying to send. And I heard from my mentor that there was a paper out that said that self hugs actually gave the same amount of or same or similar amount of feel good hormones that hugs from others were giving. So if those of you that are missing hugs from kiddos and hugs from families, if you give yourself a hug, maybe those same feel good hormones are coming, coming your way. And values, how are you reflecting on your values right now? Um, I know for me, I needed to write a values list of why I was doing the work that I was doing, um, just to remind myself that even though I'm not in front of people right now and talking to um, people in the sense of live people, that I was doing this because I believe in educator well-being and this was a different way to reach educators. Maybe it's time to check in with your values of why you are working with young ones and and give that an opportunity to reconnect to your values. Uh, gratitude lists. Uh, the magic that I've heard is in um, the research is saying that if you share those gratitudes, so maybe texting three gratitudes to your friend at the end of the day, maybe they'll text back three gratitudes and you have a gratitude chain going so that you have an opportunity to share those gratitudes with each other. And journaling, um, journaling is a great way to get out your values around why you got into this business in the first place. Identify resources. Um, Mr. Rogers said it best when he said, find the helpers. I think there's a lot of shame around finding helpers. We don't know. We've not done this work before in this way. 
it is okay to ask for help and we should be asking for help. And I don't like that word should because it's a judgment, but um, we would be more effective if we, there's a reframe, we would be more effective if we asked for help. And this is a time to do that. And it's a time to really ask for help for what you need to do your job and to do it to a place where you feel good about yourself and distance and disinfect. So Mackenzie, I believe you're up next. Uh, the little graphic on the left here is from um, the National Center on Pyramid Model Innovations or challengingbehavior.org. It's one of the resources that will be either you downloaded in the in the um, the lobby or the wait room, um, but it also be sent out to you after this webinar is over. They've got some great resources up. So I want to just think about how are we supporting families, and we're going to use that same. Um, face COVID acronym, um, we're just going to shift it slightly to how are we supporting those families and, you know, from a distance. So the first is focus on what's in your control. So I think the thing that we can get at with families, so things I always think about too with pyramid model or ECPBIS, you know, we're thinking about the bottom of the pyramid, supporting all children. So we really want to be focusing on building positive relationships and having nurturing and supportive environments. So with that environment piece, the thing that's really in families control is having con consistent daily schedule. I know that was probably after I took a week of um, being a little bit in denial that we were um, now home for a long foreseeable future. Um, well, the first thing we kind of did was set up a new schedule and said, okay, um, and this is the schedule more or less that we're using. We've had to tweak it a little bit over the weeks, but um, more or less what our days are going to look like so that we're getting a nice mix of um, activities, keeping the children engaged because we know when children are engaged in appropriate activities that they cannot be engaged in challenging behavior. And with a three and five year old at home, I was like, all right, we're right in the zone of early childhood and I got to keep them busy or um, I'm going to lose my mind, to be honest. Um, so that was kind of one of the things that we did first and foremost. So thinking about how can you talk to families about that daily schedule if they don't have that in place. And also within that, those predictable routines, right? So how are you doing the same thing in the same order? So example for bedtime, right? So if you have the same steps from going from whatever before, you know, bedtime to bedtime. So if it's dinner to bedtime, you know, are we putting on PJs, brushing teeth, reading two stories, singing a song, saying goodnight, lights out, you know, that order makes that routine even more predictable for children. Because with a lot of uncertainty right now, and they feel that even if we're not talking about it, um, this is one of those places where we can help support children. The next thing, so we're talking about acknowledging your thoughts and feelings. We also want our children to be able to talk about their feelings right now. Um, and so thinking about ways where families can fit that in um, on a daily basis. So maybe they do a daily check-in. Maybe it's in the morning. Maybe um, at nighttime there or at dinner time, you know, you're doing your highs and lows of the day. What's the best thing, the hardest thing? Or maybe um, what were the range of feelings you felt today? Um, or maybe when you're talking about stories, maybe it's easy for kids to talk about their own feelings when they're kind of talking about other characters that they're reading about. Um, there's lots and lots of visuals out there for um, sharing with families about, you know, feeling charts and giving children that visual to um, point to them to talk about them and to kind of express them. And I think this is going to be really important too, as as children kind of move back into their settings, however long that's going to take, really checking in and letting feel, children talk about their feelings because some of them might be really excited about, you know, going back to places as things start opening up. Some people might feel really, or some children might feel really anxious. Um, so there's a whole wide range of things that we want to let children express. All right, our next one, come back into your body. So I think teaching children um, how to do different breathing exercises is a great place to like help them get back into their body. Um, the graphic you're seeing right now is from challengingbehavior.org and it's this idea of smelling a flower, blowing a pinwheel. There are a million ways to teach breathing um, and there is no wrong or right one. Um, so, you know, even something fun like blowing bubbles is a great way to just encourage children to take those deep breaths. Um, and sometimes if children are really upset, we can start taking deep breaths ourselves and they will kind of mirror that. 
um, although it is more effective if you kind of practice it in advance and then use it kind of in the moment. Um, and then for E, engage in what you're doing. Um, so really helping families find that time to be present with their child. And even if it is literally five minutes, um, and I'm not using literal as a figurative, I mean, like if you can just set a timer for five minutes and be completely present with the child, um, for, for some families, that's going to be all they can give right now. Um, you know, between working remotely or all of the stress that can come with this pandemic. Um, but giving that time for children can really help build those relationships and keep children and caregivers feeling connected during this time. When we get to committed action, um, I like to think about how family members can help each other out. And that's not something that we can figure out for families, but we can always ask them that question of, hey, how are you supporting each other? Um, and sometimes we're talking about siblings, sometimes we're talking about partners, um, kind of that whole gamut of how can we get creative um, and, and help each other out the most. Um, and then opening up, so helping families be kind to themselves and bring kindness into their home. Um, we've got a quote here from the Greater Good magazine where they really talk about um, increasing our own happiness happens when we help other people be happy. And they've shown in lots of studies that kindness and generosity have been linked to life satisfaction, strong relationships, um, better mental and physical health, um, and generous people tend to live longer. So lots of good motivation to do that. Um, it's going to be, you know, we talk about um you know, this, this idea of bucket filling, there's a series of books about that. But when you do something kind to someone else, or if you fill someone's bucket, that it fills your own as well. And I find this true time and time again. Um, okay, so the V here we're going to talk about is values. Um, and the way I kind of interpreted this one is, um, as we're helping families create that um, kind of engaging environment that's really predictable and safe and secure, one of those things might be a time to think about what are our home rules. And they might have changed, right? So if we have families where they are working at home, the rules of how we um, interact and how we behave and when we can do things might have changed. So it might be a good time to check in and say, hey, let's have a conversation about what are our house rules. Um, and then, you know, if you can make the visual to go with that, especially for our younger children who are not reading yet, that helps them remember them. Um, but involving children in those rules, you know, laying out, here's the parameters, I have to get work done, you have these, you know, school Zoom videos or whatever going on, or, you know, you need to find some activities that are going to be um, engaging and helpful, and I'll help you with that. But how are we going to make sure that we're getting all of our things done, and we're being kind to each other? Um, so it's a great time to do that, have children help you with those. Um, you can help them make the visuals together. Um, when you're having children kind of help create rules, they always often need help making sure that they're stating them in the positive. So telling children, telling themselves like what to do as opposed to, you know, inevitably though someone will say something like no hitting, no kicking, no punching, right? So then we help them reframe that into like, let's have gentle bodies or let's be um, kind to other people's bodies or gentle hands or whatever the terminology is going to be. Um, we also want to make sure we're having few rules, right? These are not a laundry list of things that we need to do to be um, well behaved. Um, it's more of here are overarching ways to behave in the, the home and with each other and with our stuff too, right? So go over them, um, reinforce them with positive feedback and attention, let children know when they are um, following those expectations and those rules. When we get to identifying resources, this is a spot where you can be really helpful to families. Um, but what resources do families need right now? And remember, we might be getting back to like, what are those basic needs? Um, you know, helping families find, you know, food resources. And we one of the resources that um, we're sharing with you is um, all about figuring out how to find um help for families who are food insecure right now. Maybe we're linking them up to 211 for other resources. Whatever it is, this might be a time where you're doing a little bit of resource and referral for your families, because um, it can be a little bit scary and a little bit hard to get some of those basic needs met right now. I mean, I find that every time I go to the grocery store, I feel feelings, strong feelings of anxiety. And, you know, I have my routine down pretty well, 
Uh, but it still feels so different from, you know, before the pandemic. Um, and then the last one is disinfect and distance. So um, there are lots of hand washing resources out there, lots of um, video clips and visuals. And, you know, there's Sesame Street characters that will show you how to wash your hands. Um, so lots of ways to, to help out with that. Um, so those are things that you can also share with your families too, so that their young children are um, remembering and learning how to be good hand washers. So with that, we thank you for being here and taking the time um, out of your busy schedules.